Electromagnetic induction is the generation of electricity from a time-varying magnetic field. It is undoubtedly one of the most significant discoveries in human history, which helped usher the new electrical age and opened a wide range of possible applications for electricity. This is one of a two-part story about the unification of electricity and magnetism. We tell the discovery of electromagnetic induction through the lens of Michael Faraday, the great experimentalist and the father of electrical engineering. On the study wall at his apartment in Berlin, Albert Einstein hanged the portraits of three English scientists, that of Isaac Newton, Michael Faraday and James Clerk Maxwell. Albert Einstein once said, the greatest change in the axiomatic basis of physics, and correspondingly in our conception of the structure of reality, since the foundation of theoretical physics through Newton, came about through the researches of Faraday and Maxwell on electromagnetic phenomena. Today, electromagnetic induction is essential to our daily life. The ubiquitous electric generator, which can be found in automobiles, bicycles, and so on, uses magnetism to generate electricity. Wireless charging of cell phone also uses the principles of electromagnetic induction, where an induction coil is used to create an oscillating magnetic field, which the receiver coil in the phone converts back into electricity to be fed into the battery. Most kitchen uses an induction cooktop, where coils located just underneath carry an alternating current, which produces a changing magnetic field leading to eddy currents on the cooking pan and produces heat. Similar wireless power transfer can also be used to light up an induction lamp hovering in the air. Michael Faraday's discovery of electromagnetic induction dramatically changed the way we lived. Our story begins in 1820, when the Danish physicist and chemist, Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that a compass needle was deflected from magnetic north by a nearby electric current. The compass needle points in a circular manner in a direction described by the so-called right thumb rule. Ørsted experiment confirmed a direct relationship between electricity and magnetism. Electromagnetism, or electrodynamics, was born. Then entered André Marie Ampère in 1820, a French physicist and mathematician and a well-established member of the French Newtonian School of Mathematical Physicists. His first inclination was to investigate if two current carrying wires exert a force on each other. To his delight, the wires indeed attract when current flow in the same direction and repel when they flow in the opposite direction. The momentous idea came to Ampere that current is the source of magnetism. With great ingenuity and mathematical rigor, Ampere was able to derive the forces between elemental current, showing that it is analogous to that of electrical and gravitational forces. Today, we understand the ubiquitous nature of the inverse square law because of a point source which radiates outwards in a 3D space. Nevertheless, we now have the building blocks for the theory of electricity and magnetism from elemental charges and current. As James Clark Maxwell later puts it, the whole theory and experiment seems as if it had leapt, full-grown and full-armed, from the brain of the Newton of electricity. The theory of electrodynamics was born. At this time, Michael Faraday was working at the Royal Institution, researching the alloys of steel. Having little formal education, Faraday learned no mathematics beyond simple algebra and trigonometry. Thus, he derived his understanding from experimental observations rather than deducing them from mathematical models. Over time, this approach gave him a deep intuition into electromagnetic phenomena. In Faraday's letter to Ampere, he said, I am unfortunate in a want of mathematical knowledge and the power of entering with facility any abstract reasoning. I am obliged to feel my way by facts placed closely together. The mainstream interpretation about the discoveries by Ørsted and Ampere was that the current carrying wire exerted a force on the compass needle, thus causing it to deflect. Such prevailing Newtonian idea that magnetic force act at a distance does not seem quite right to Faraday. Could it be that the current carrying wire actually set up magnetic lines of force permeating its surrounding space? These ideas were fuzzy at the beginning and took time to firm up over the years. As Faraday later explained in 1831, by magnetic curves, I mean lines of magnetic forces which would be depicted by iron fillings. 
In 1821, Faraday set up to test his ideas of such curved lines of forces. What follows demonstrate Faraday's genius. Faraday secured a bar magnet at the bottom of a basin and filled it up with mercury, exposing only the top segment of the bar magnet. He dangled a short wire from a supporting stem so that its bottom end dip in the mercury is shown. Then, he connected the top end of the wire to a battery, with the other end of the battery terminal to the mercury, thus forming a closed current circuit. To his great delight, the bottom end of the wire moved around the magnet in rapid circular motion. Faraday has discovered the first electric motor. We can imagine the joy when Faraday wrote the simple words in his journal, very satisfactory. The explicit mathematical form of this so-called circular force, given by the cross product between the current and the magnetic field, was derived by Hendrik Lorentz in 1895. The generation of magnetism from electricity was becoming common knowledge. A current carrying coil, when suspended, would align itself north-south. An ordinary piece of iron would transform into a permanent magnet when placed briefly in the coil. A powerful magnet can be constructed by placing a ferromagnetic material, such as iron, into the solenoid. Such a device is known as an electromagnet. In 1831, Michael Faraday finally succeeded in demonstrating electromagnetic induction, the generation of electricity from magnetism. His apparatus consisted of a ring of iron, wound around on opposite sides by two coils of wire. The coil of the left was connected to a battery, while the coil on the right to a galvanometer, which measures the flow of a current. When he connected the left circuit, allowing a continuous current flow, Faraday observed the galvanometer needle started to move. The needle flung to the left momentarily, and then settles back to center, despite the fact that the current in the left circuit is still flowing. When Faraday disconnected the left circuit, the galvanometer registered a reading again, but this time the needle flung to the right instead. Again momentarily and then settles back to the center position. From his observation of the circular motion in his electric motor experiment, to the electromagnetic induction of a remote secondary coil, Faraday is beginning to be convinced that magnetic forces has a real physical presence in space. Faraday wrote later, I cannot conceive curved lines of force without the conditions of a physical existence in that intermediate space. Such a viewpoint cannot be more different than the Newtonian school of thoughts, which believe that forces in nature act at a distance between material bodies, and do not concern about the intervening space. Faraday was beginning to realize how sharply his ideas diverged from the mainstream. Ampere highly mathematical theory of magnetism, set in the tradition of Newtonian forces action at a distance, is universally accepted, but was unable to explain what he just observed. Faraday began formulating an intuitive physical picture of what is happening in terms of the lines of forces. The switching on of the left circuit produces magnetic field lines in the interior of the left coils, which then propagates towards the right coil, guided by the iron ring. As the magnetic field lines began to cut the right coils, these magnetic lines produced a current in the coil. The rate of magnetic field lines cutting decrease as it eventually propagates throughout the iron core, and the galvanometer would then register zero current. However, the current in the left coil is still flowing, and the magnetic field lines are still permeating through the iron core, but the rate of change of magnetic field lines as seen from the right coil is zero. Thus, the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction is transient, which is no wonder it had escaped observations and experiment all this time. The induced current flow depends on the rate of change of the magnetic flux, or the magnetic field lines integrated over its cross-sectional area. The induced current is due to a so-called electromotive force, denoted by the symbol epsilon, and has the dimension of voltage. The electromotive force is therefore like an effective voltage source which drives the current through the galvanometer. This equation encapsulates Faraday's law of induction. It actually took more than a decade, from the discovery of the phenomenon of electromagnetic induction in 1831 by Faraday, to arrive at a concrete mathematical description of the phenomenon. 
In 1832, the American scientist Joseph Henry discovered the phenomenon of self-inductance independently of Faraday. The Russian scientist Emil Lenz clarified the directionality of the electromotive force and the induced current in 1834. The laws of induction of electric currents in mathematical form was only established in 1845 by the German scientist Franz Ernst Neumann. We will elaborate on these ideas in what follows. We shall describe Faraday's electromagnetic induction experiment in more quantitative terms. The flow of an electric current through the solenoid on the left produces a magnetic flux that links the coil 1 with 2, which we denote as phi 1 2. According to Ampere's law, this is proportional to the current through coil 1, herein denoted as I1. The proportionality constant is given by the permeability times the cross-section area, A, times the number of loops, N1, divided by the length of the solenoid, L. An electromotive force, epsilon 2, will be induced on the second coil, which according to Faraday's law is given by the number of coils multiplied by the rate of change of magnetic flux with time. But how does one decide the polarity of this induced voltage? Lenz's law states that the direction of the induced electric current is such that the magnetic field it creates will counteract the magnetic field that produces it, as indicated by the orange arrow. The negative sign in Faraday's law is an embodiment of Lenz's law. Thus, according to the right thumb rule, the polarity of epsilon 2 is such that the induced current flows in the direction as indicated. Finally, combining both the Ampere's and Faraday's law allow us to express the electromotive force in terms of the rate of change of the applied current, whose proportionality constant is known as the mutual inductance, herein denoted as M21. In 1832, Joseph Henry discovered the phenomenon of self-inductance, independently of Faraday. As the name implies, any coil which admits the flow of a current, can also induce an electrical voltage across itself. This induced voltage also follows the Faraday law of induction, which goes with the rate of change of the current flowing through it. The proportionality constant is its inductance L. Notice that we have dropped the minus sign since we are referring here to the voltage drop across a passive conductor instead of an electromotive force. Faraday's original iron ring covered in copper wires and cotton cloth used in his electromagnetic induction experiment is still on display at the Royal Institution. His discovery of electromagnetic induction was groundbreaking on every level. However, on a practical level, it was unsatisfactory in two aspects. First, the source of his magnetism, which generated the electricity, was produced from electricity. It would be ideal if the electricity was produced from an actual magnet instead. Second, the generated electricity is only momentarily, and any practical use would require a continuous source of electricity. In the same year, Faraday began setting up his new experiment to generate continuous electricity from a permanent magnet. Faraday's new setup consists of a conducting copper disc mounted on an axle. He set an edge of the disc between the poles of a powerful permanent horseshoe magnet. He then made electrical contacts by placing one brush contact on one edge of the disc, and the other to the axle, and connecting the two contacts to a galvanometer. When the disc rotates, the galvanometer needle moved, but this time it stayed in its new position. A steady electrical current was being produced. A decade after making the first electric motor, Faraday made the world first electric generator, or dynamo. The copper disc while rotating is constantly cutting the magnetic field lines emanating from the magnet, which according to Faraday's law would establish an electromotive force. Since the disc is consistently cutting the field lines in the same manner, the current flow is therefore constant. The English scientist, John Ambrose Fleming, devised a simple rule which allows one to determine the directionality of the current flow due to the presence of a magnetic field and physical motion in an electric generator. This is known as the Fleming right-hand rule. An analogous left-hand rule can also be devised to establish the directionality of the physical motion due to the presence of the magnetic field and electric current. Within a decade, 
Michael Faraday careful observation and experimentation in electromagnetism had led to the discoveries of electromagnetic induction and the invention of the electric motor, generator and transformers. Undoubtedly, these inventions, which underwent subsequent evolution, allowed electricity to be put into practical use in almost all aspect of society. On a fundamental level, Faraday's discovery of the electromagnetic induction has also laid the foundation for circuit theoretics in terms of four fundamental variables: the current I, the voltage V, the electric charge Q, and the magnetic flux phi. The electric current is the rate of change of charge, and Faraday's law establishes the voltage as the rate of change of flux. These two fundamental relations are accompanied by three axiomatic definitions of three circuit elements. The first being the resistor, whose electrical attribute resistance is defined as the change of voltage with respect to current. Jörg Ohm found a direct proportionality between the electrical current and voltage in 1827, now known as the Ohm's law. Hence, the unit of resistance is ohm. The second circuit element is the capacitor, whose electrical attribute capacitance is defined as the change of charge with respect to voltage. The concept of capacitance was first discovered by Alessandro Volta in 1776, where he found this direct proportionality between charge and voltage in some objects. For his work, the unit of voltage was named after Volta. In the 1830s, Michael Faraday did experiments which determined that the material in between capacitors plates influenced the quantity of charge on the plates. The notion of dielectric material was being introduced afterwards, and the unit of capacitance is Farad. Lastly, the third circuit element is the inductor, whose electrical attribute inductance measures the change of flux with respect to current. Inductance, in this instance, refers to self-inductance rather than mutual inductance. The phenomenon becomes stronger if the conductor is formed into a coil and further strengthens if the coil surrounds a material that is permeable to magnetic flux. In honor of Joseph Henry, the unit of inductance is known as the Henry. Electromagnetism on a circuit theoretics level is thus complete thanks to Michael Faraday. For this and the widespread significance of his inventions to the field, he is well regarded as the father of electrical engineering. Since the birth of electromagnetism with the discoveries by Ørsted and Ampere, Faraday has brought to bear the mystery of how electricity can be generated from magnetism. His discoveries were through experimentation in the laboratories, guided by a deep-seated sense of intuition, and owe nothing to mathematics or the emerging electrodynamics theory of the day. Vague and tentative at first, some of these ideas are beginning to take shape. This includes the concept of lines of forces permeating space, as opposed to Newtonian idea of action at a distance. Faraday's intuition also led him to believe that magnetic action is progressive and takes time and was inclined to think that the propagation of this action is mediated by waves. Faraday's experimental and phenomenological approach to electromagnetism had laid the groundwork and seed for the next evolution in the field. It would require the mathematical and theoretical wizardry of James Clerk Maxwell to bring these ideas to light. Literary speaking. Stay tuned and subscribe so you will be notified of our future episodes.